title of this talk is Laughter of the Clouds, Long Music, Longing, and Ecstatic Joy. I'd like to present to you what I do, what my work is, and uh, what I'd like it to be, my motivations, and then I'm going to play a song that will hopefully encapsulate everything I've talked about in this talk. Uh, just to start, here's a couple photos of me playing um, in Brooklyn this year. Uh, that one on the left takes place in a deli that has concerts, so that's a real operating lotto machine. And uh, just to give you an idea of what it looks like when I play. I've been playing solo since 2011. I usually play with uh, just what you see here, an electric guitar, some pedals, and my voice. And since 2011, I've um, released four different full-length recordings. Uh, the one in the top left corner is with a band called The Early, Ben Serratin and The Early. Uh, it's like a rock record that we did over two weeks in Portland, Oregon, over Thanksgiving in 2011. Uh, the other three are called New Music, New Space, and New Song, and they're part of a series each for electric guitar and voice. So what I'd like to talk about today is um, the moment of origin. You know, uh, there's this famous story of the apple falling on Newton's head. Uh, with my music, I had a similar moment of, of uh, semi-painful revelation. So let's go back to the spring of 2011. I was playing in this band, do champion. Uh, this is me and three friends from college. We all studied together at Wesleyan University. Uh, that's a big part of what I'm doing. Wesleyan University is a center for experimental music. Uh, the luminary Alvin Lucier teaches there, and they encourage you to look into the curriculum of people like John Cage, people like Lamont Young, people like Terry Riley. Uh, Anthony Braxton, also a famous saxophonist uh, in the free jazz kind of post-bop realm, teaches there as well. And uh, they also teach a lot of ethnomusicology. They have a really large Javanese gamelan there. So when I studied music at Wesleyan, I had a lot of streams coming in, a lot of ideas to think about. And I met three like-minded young gentlemen, and we formed a band. After college, we continued to play. We put out an LP. Uh, this is the cover from the LP we put out. Uh, you can see my arm there on the uh, right-hand side. Uh, that's this very forearm. Um, and we continued to play until the spring of 2011, but like a lot of uh, young people, we didn't know what we were doing with our lives. And one member moved to the West Coast, one member moved to Poland for a while. We could no longer play. I was suddenly without a band. But I wanted to continue, I wanted to continue the work that I was doing with this group in some way, so I decided to start playing solo. And since uh, the electric guitar is what I like to play, I thought I would play the electric guitar and sing. But I also wanted to sound like this band. This band was loud and cacophonous and really fun and uh, really busy, a lot of frenetic energy behind us while we played. So I wanted to keep that work up, but I had to figure out how to do it with just an electric guitar. At the time, I was also working here. Uh, this is a photo of something called the Dream House. This is a sound and light installation in New York City in the Tribeca neighborhood. It is an empty apartment that is filled with this eerie magenta light. There's gels on all the windows, so everything is suffused with this kind of uh, neon glow. And it's filled with speakers that are emanating a low kind of, you can imagine like a 50-foot tall refrigerator, just kind of like, ooh, you know. Um, so loud that when you speak, you can't even really hear the words that come out of your mouth. And I was working here uh, six hours a week, volunteering here and letting people in and making sure that they didn't mess anything up, just kind of sitting outside the door. So I was really interested in doing something that was lengthy and that uh, had no beginning and had no end and was something that people could immerse themselves in, that they could meditate within. This is a continuation of what I studied in college and something I wanted to keep doing in my solo music. So with all of these ideas in mind, I booked my first show as Ben Saratan, the solo artist, at this pretty terrible club in New York City, and uh, just so happened that literally one person was in the audience. And uh, with these big ideas in mind, I went and I, and, I, and I wanted to play a show, right? So I had my guitar, which I had started tuning in a special way to, uh, to uh, sound more like a band, and I had these ideas of minimalism floating in behind me. And I went up, and I went to sing my first note in the microphone, and like the apple hitting Newton's head, Lightning struck, I was very badly electrocuted, uh, zap, right in the kisser, uh, as I was trying to sing. And uh, it was a very shocking moment, right, okay? And uh, I suddenly realized what it was I wanted to be doing. I had been going about it the wrong way. What playing music had always afforded to me, and would hopefully continue to afford me in the future, 
was access to a type of happiness, an unreal state of affairs that can't necessarily be accessed in your day-to-day -day life. It's something that can bring people together, that can allow my, I, I, allows me to communicate ideas more effectively than I can with words, as maybe I'm demonstrating right now. Um, and it was a, a, a real motivation for me, and I'd never had a vocabulary for it before. But I played this show, I uh, nursed my wounds, and I went home, and the next day I went to work early, and uh, at this particular job, there's a grand piano in the back office, and I went back there, and I wrote this song, which I didn't realize it at the time, has be but has become a, a prescient, a real, a real mantra for me. So uh, the song's called Joy. It's from my first recording as a solo artist, and I'll just read the lyrics to you now. Joy is what we're after, the laughter of the clouds, crowns of sound and hailing, holy be thy name. Joy if it doesn't kill me, triumph even if it does, 10,000 volts of lightning stemming from my lips. Sort of like the joy of falling or dying in a dream, water off of a rock cliff, billowing in steam, hammering the instrument hard enough to feel the light that it is made of, that is joy and it is real. Uh, so yeah, that song, at the time, I, I didn't realize it, but that has really become a roadmap for what I'm doing with music. Talking about those moments um, is important, and uh, music itself is a way to access them. And that all leads to this phrase, uh, ecstatic joy. And uh, I'll show you. You can maybe not see it from there, but you can see it, right? Ecstatic joy tattooed right there in a lightning bolt font in a commemoration of uh, this electrocution that happened. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's the most accurate two-word phrase I've found to describe what it is I'm after. Um, this is an excerpt from a letter I had once published on a, a music blog. Music that for me gives an audible texture to feelings of warmth, gratitude, and laughing doubled over in uncontrollable fits. Uh, we've all had these moments of being around loved ones, of having something so tremendously hilarious happen that there's nothing to do but just laugh. And uh, that's, that's really... Uh, what it's about. And playing music for me often is, uh, gives, gives me that feeling, uh, especially when playing with others. Sometimes um, it just feels so good, and so it's ecstatic joy. Just to um, illustrate that point further, I want to show you this photo. Um, my dear friend Alex Lewis, who's an independent radio producer, took this photo when we were in Portland, Maine together earlier this year. We had gone out to this island called Peaks Island off the coast of Maine, and uh, in a moment of abandon, I uh, ripped off all my clothes and ran into the water. Uh, water was easily below 50 degrees. It was very cold. And I, I dove in head first. And uh, it was a real shock to my system. And when I came up, my friends were hooting and hollering for me on the shore. They were applauding. And one of them said, you're a champion, Ben. Raise your hands in the air. And they took this photo. So um, you get the idea of, uh, of uh, what I'm after with ecstatic joy. Um, I also like the term, I, just, I, should, I should mention, uh, I like the term ecstatic joy because it's related to the history of uh, ecstatic jazz. Um, it's a, another type of music that uh, is deeply influential in my work, especially more in the past year. Um, people like Alice Coltrane and Pharaoh Sanders, uh, they uh, push their instruments to the point of near breaking with the amount of notes that they cram in there. And they're just um, dazzlingly proficient at their work and they invite these kind of uh, cosmic meditative themes into their work. My, my favorite Pharaoh Sanders song is called Love is Everywhere. The lyrics of the song are Love is Everywhere. And it goes on for about five minutes and it's just, it's just wonderful. So uh, ecstatic joy really sums all those things up. Um, but it's not just ecstatic joy necessarily that I'm after. Uh, there's also kind of the, the other side of ecstatic joy, how um, you're able to, to, to get to that point. And uh, I call that long music. Long music, here we have a working definition, largely improvised, extremely repetitive music that goes beyond the typical temporal limitations of physical media and performance norms and creates something approximating a habitable auditory space with an emphasis on sustained tones and meditation. Like I said, working definition. I'm trying to pare it down a little bit. But this is music that goes on for a really long time and doesn't change much. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a way of playing that allows uh, the music to become a mirror for the audience members and allows me to calm myself down while I'm playing. And I don't have a lot of time on stage today, so I, I don't think I'm going to be able to demonstrate to you uh, exactly what that sounds like. Um, but it's something that, that usually takes a long time. Here are some photos of a performance we did at the uh, Judson Memorial Church. Me and a group of friends we call BF Bifocals, a kind of collective design group. We occasionally do performances. And uh, you can see maybe there's two tiny little amplifiers on this giant stage. This church is 
gigantic and, uh, and quite historic. We played for, I played my guitar for two straight hours uninterrupted from 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. And uh, people were invited in, they were invited to explore the space. You'll see the next photo is uh, my friend Alex laying down in front of, you know those Swedish candle angels where they burn and the smoke rises and they, they turn the bells on, you know what I'm talking about? We had one of those going and it was, it was very beautiful. So that's, that's an, another aspect of my project and something I'm gonna expand here when I'm in Alaska is uh, this idea of long music. I hope to do a series of four hour concerts in the fall. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty much everything I'd like to talk about today. I'm gonna now take some time to play a song, but just to give you some context, uh, the song I'm gonna play was written when I was living in upstate New York last year. And uh, as you can see, I have my guitar outside. I was able to work kind of in nature. And uh, adjacent to this hill where I was rehearsing, there was a white horse that would run up and down the hill that uh, I became really enamored with. And that's just a photo of uh, where I'd go swimming every day when I lived there last year. So uh, give me one second and I'll grab my guitar. So this song is called uh, My One True Love, and it's from uh, my record, New Song, and uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. It goes like this. I 
I will see you. I will see you. See you. See you. On that other shore, my one true love. On that other shore, my one true love. other shore my one true love on that other shore my one true love thank you